big picture, what, what's, the, what's the largest player globally in grocery, in food and grocery? What's the largest player? Wake up now. Walmart. Walmart. Walmart, yeah, Walmart. Turnover? Turnover of Walmart globally in US billion? What would it be? What, what might it be? You can only get it wrong, come on. <laughs> and we're in cattle country, so we, we can do... Sorry? We'll, we'll start, that's an opening, thank you. A hundred, hundred, any advance on a hundred? Hundred. Hundred and fifty, thank you, the man with the hat. Hundred and fifty. Any advance on 150? 150, 150, do we hear more? It, it's about 410 billion, 415 billion. They do about 105 billion each quarter. And the profitability? Well, actually, like many retail, it's about 3, 3.5%, which is sort of pretty small. But at the same time, if that's on the basis of 410 billion, that still delivers you about 14 billion worth of profit. Here we are, Walmart with turnover of 410 billion US dollars. Far and away the largest company in terms of turnover in, in the world. That's one. Uh, two, and it would help if I could just put the next slide up. Thank you. Thanks very much. Walmart has about a 20-21% grocery market share in the US. And the number two global retailer is, anybody know? Number two global retailer? going global, is Carrefour, the French retailer. And they turn over less than a third of Walmart. Less than one third. So there's a pretty big bloody gap, isn't there, between, you know, you've got 130 million billion for Carrefour, 410 billion for, for Walmart. And it suddenly struck me what being a major player in the US was, was all about. And I saw in The Economist, this is a wonderful graph. I hope you can see it from here. So you've got the states, the USA by state, and then imposed on the state's name are the country that have the same gross domestic product. So here you've got, let's start, see if it works now. Here we go. California, roughly the same GDP as Italy. And what about Texas? Texas, the same GDP as Russia. Does not take your breath away. Where would Canada stand in that? Actually, somewhere in between. It's not as big as California by any manner of means, and it's slightly bigger than Texas. And so I do lots of work in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia, and they sort of fancy their arm internationally. And as I tell them, that New Zealand comes right, right up there with Kansas. <laughs> and Australia has the same GDP as New York State. But here's one more. I just don't want to go on. But if you take the... And we talk so much about emerging markets and their importance and, you know, bye-bye, old world. It's all about the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, etc. If you take... Uh, Wisconsin, which if my geography is about right, is Finland. So Wisconsin, I mean, you know, I don't see that as a big state. There's a lot of dairy cattle there, but it's got the same GDP as Finland, which has the same GDP as Shanghai and the region around it. So you've got that Shanghai region, which has got roughly, just slightly less, the population of Canada. But actually, it's GDP come, comes in at Wisconsin. So what's my whole point here? That uh, uh, Clearly, it's an exciting world out there in terms of emerging markets. But let's not forget about the old, sleepy, backward, slipping into oblivion economies like Europe, like the US, because they still have the income. That's where the money is still. And it's good to remember that. On we go. Okay, so 
uh, let's be slightly more meaty. I mean, I love working in the food industry uh, and globally, and again, an opportunity to just go absolutely everywhere, which is just brilliant for me. And why? Because food is special. It's sort of unique to certain regions, to cultures. Uh, it's sort of pervaded with uh, tradition. Uh, what is acceptable in one area is totally unacceptable in, in, in another. You know, it's not a widget. It's not something you can move irrespective around the globe. You've got to really understand what do local consumers value and are willing to pay a premium for. And here I am in Nanjing, for example, in the live turtle section of the meat department of, I think it was a Walmart. And so we take live turtles. Live turtles were available in one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, male, female, wild, farmed. And they ranged in retail price yuan per kg between 25 yuan per kg to 150 yuan per kg. I thought, what's all that about? You know, do we think we understand the meat market in, in China? Well, I think you've got to know something about live turtles before you say you can. Or, you know, it's not just Johnny Foreigner who's a bit bloody odd. I was talking the other day in Switzerland, and uh, Switzerland, you know, I mean, that's a sophisticated country. And here we've got fondue chinoise, classic. And it's horse meat fondue. And I hadn't got down the Swiss as being, you know, big on horse. There we go. What do they value and are willing to pay a premium for? And it ranges so much around the world. Uh, and of course, I mean, back to my market, this is hardly uh, uh, meat. But, uh, you know, again, just to show that it's just not Johnny Foreigner, here's Walkers, which is PepsiCo, which is Lay's. In Canada, these would be called Lay's, not Walkers. And uh, you probably aren't big ones for Cajun squirrel or Chilean chocolate chips. We are. We like them. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, I mean, the interesting thing about food, again, is that it's not just its taste that drives sort of preferences, it's also the values associated with its pr production, its processing, and its treatment. And again, as I look around the world, you know, it's completely different. So, for example, here we've got, you know, I mean, I particularly like the guy down the bottom there, just by the exhaust pipe. He's, he looks sort of really cozy, if not barbecued. In many countries, this would be illegal. In Vietnam, you know, that it's perfectly acceptable. So if I look at your industry, if I look at the meat industry, if I look at the food industry overall and try to pick out what I think are going to be the big issues, which are the big issues, then I have to start, actually, Charlie, it's with, we're back to food prices. And this is food price inflation. And if you take the FAO food price index, it's going back to, what is it, 1990. Look, if you take that period, 1990, through to about 2005, actually you could have extended back to 1975, and what do we see around the world? Relatively stable, relatively stable. And in many respects, just edging down in real terms. And then what's happened? What is happening out there? 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 10, 11. We're right bang in the middle of one of the most volatile periods in food prices that we've seen for generations, generations. And does that matter? Well, I think it's really, really important. Not least, it depends where you come from. So if you take, this is importance of food in the consumer price index for selected countries. If you take, say, the Philippines, then 50% of household income goes on food. Uh, let's take Vietnam, 40%. Whereas in Canada, it would be roughly the same as the US, 12%, 13%. Uh, I lived in Africa for four years. In Kenya, it would be 70%. And so can you imagine being in those emerging countries now where the price of grain has more than doubled over the last two or three years? I mean, it doesn't really matter in Canada if the price of corn goes up. For, from a consumer perspective, by 100%. Because actually, the price of your cornflakes just edges up about 5 or 10%. But if you're in Kenya, and all you eat is maize, then your basic staple has just doubled in price, and your income is nowhere near. And so around the world, there's, there's problems. And it's reflected. I mean, I was just, what, May? So last month, here we are, Tunisia, the fall of a government. 
in Tunisia. And what provoked that were all sorts of things, but not least citizens saying, you're not controlling the price of food. It's chaos out there, and it may get a lot worse. We're in a really interesting period, and where suddenly this whole business of food security is on the lips of folk, and that hasn't been on our lips for, for decades. Will there be enough food? I'll come back to that. So, what's it like in the UK? Uh, this is grocery price, food price inflation in the UK. We're running about 3 or 4% at the moment, but the economy in Northern Europe is tough. I think it's much better in Canada. Uh, we're getting really squeezed. The public sector is going through the ringer, uh, and grocery firms are responding as you'd expect. It's all about discount. And so here we are in the UK grocery market, Aldi and Lidl. These are, I, don't, I don't know if you'd know these, these retailers, but they're world hard discounters. They're German firms that are right around the world. And in my market, these hard discounters, which is only about price, are growing at 13% year-on-year sales. Next down, Waitrose and Sainsbury's, these are sort of premium retailers, if you will, are seeing decent growth too. So you see growth at the real value end, cheap, cheap end, and growth at the premium end. And where it's tough is in the middle. That's Asda, which is Walmart in the UK, and, and Tesco, which are barely keeping up with inflation. And as a result of that, retailers are sort of focusing on uh, how can we reduce the overall grocery bill? Here's Tesco, uh, sorry, Sainsbury's saying, feed your family for 50 pounds, which is, uh, what, $80 Canadian. Saying, for $80 Canadian, uh, we'll be able to give you food that will give you three meals a day for four people for seven days. So there's huge focus on value from a UK and, in fact, many retailers around the globe. I see it wherever I go. Here's Coles in Australia. Feed your family for under $10. Do we get that in Canada at the moment? You know, are there sort of are the loblaws of this world making statements about, uh, is it about price? Is it about value? No? No, no, not yet. Uh, and it's the same in food service. You know, here we are in the US, five for five dollars from KFC. And it's, as we go through this sort of awkward period of recovering from recession, remember many of the developed countries of the world are recovering from recession. I don't know if Canada actually technically ever went into recession, uh, but all of Europe did, I can assure you. Uh, it's had a particular profound impact on certain areas. So, for example, organic just got hammered in the UK. Organic is down 25, 30% uh, from, say, two years ago and is not recovering. I, that is not the case in Canada and the US, where from a much lower base, it didn't get hammered so much going through the, re the recession. Uh, for us, retailers are looking at, uh, here's Tesco with a uh, five pounds meal deal for two. What do you get for that? A main course, a side dish, and, and a, a dessert for two people for eight dollars. That's a good offer. Or here, here's Tesco with their Tesco finest dinner for two. You get a really nice ready meal for two, with a side, with a nice dessert, say, uh, I don't know, cheesecake, and a bottle of wine for nine pounds, which would be $15. That's $7.50 per serving, if you will. That's good value. You can see the amount of pressure that the food industry is in. There it is. Actually, we just had that meal, my wife and I, and it was classic braised beef with uh, Melton Red Ale, Vegetables were oven-baked potatoes with smoked bacon. It was strawberry cheesecake, and it was a very decent bottle of wine, as I say, for 15 bucks. That's good value. I'm not sure if I'd want to be supplying them. Where's the margin? Pretty tough. And it says, same right across uh, food service. You see this in the US, too. Here's Pizza Express, two for one. Uh, I was just picking up a piece of news from the, uh, the wires the other day that 40% of those who are under 30 in the UK will check online for food service outlets for the deal before they go out to eat. And they're looking for a coupon that will give them a real deal. 